Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. My name is Rizwanullah. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, before I, before I start, my order is not that great. So in case if I need uh, order explanation or translation, Mr. Sadiq and Dr. Sifullah, inshallah, Sifu Rahman, inshallah, will help me in that. So I briefly will talk, uh, we don't have, we are time limited, we will not talk about, uh, 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 I briefly will talk about the complication and troubleshooting. Before I start that, I do believe that troubleshooting is very important. Why troubleshooting is diagnosing. Diagnosis. So if we can troubleshoot, we, we can know what is the problem, we can treat the patient. So how we can troubleshoot the ventilator or the ventilated pa patient? One of the frequent troubleshooting we have in the, our practicing is air trapping. We call it air trapping or auto peeping. So what is air trapping? Air trapping simply, that means there is air trapped in the, in the lungs, in the alveoli inside due to some reasons. So one, some of the reasons are insufficient expiratory time or early collapse of unsafe alveoli. By, by, so, uh, so how to identify the air trapping? We can identify by waveforms, by pressure waveform, by the flow waveform, and the, by the volume waveform, which we will come to that later on. The main thing now, how to fix that? So how to fix the air trapping or the auto peep? Uh, give the treatment for the, uh, we have, as you say, we have something um, uh, in, the, in, the, in the ventilator called expiratory hold. This is a button. When you, when, you, when you press it, you will cause a hold after the expiration. The, the main function, yeah, so this is a pressure waveform. As Siddiq said, this is the PIP, this is the PIP plateau, and this is the exhalation here. So after the end of exhalation, we, we hold that button the expiratory hold button, it will be in the ventilator, it will cause like a hole, it will cause like a hole, like, 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 a, like a, 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 a fixed um, hole here. It should be the same here, like it should be at the baseline. But if there is air trapping, it will be rising above the baseline. So baseline here is 5, which is our peak. If it's, uh, it's rising, now it's 9. So we are basically trapping around 4, or to be four pressure centimeter of water because the difference between the nine and five and five is four. So uh, no, no, sorry, sorry, that's a wrong mistake. So uh, here the auto peep is nine. That's above the five. So five and nine is fourteen. From the flow, which is my, my favorite one, is the flow. I, I can easily recognize that from the flow. Usually, flow. This is inspiration and expiration. It should come back to the baseline. If in cases it doesn't come back to the baseline and start inspiration again, again the trigger is here, here again and inspiration again, that means there is air trapping. That's my 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 best way or way to 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 to, to know the the uh, air trapping. From the volume, also the same as flow, it doesn't come back to that baseline. So volume it should come back here to the baseline like this here. But it doesn't it doesn't come back to the baseline. That means there is air trapping. Another thing, as Siddiq explained, is airway resistance. How we troubleshoot or how we uh, diagnose or, or identify there is uh, resi uh, airway resistance. Before that, we, we have to know the causes. Bronchospasm, ET tube problem, sometimes the ET tube is very small, it's kinked. This all will cause changes in the uh, airway resistance. Um, uh, high flow rate, secretion buildup. As Siddiq said, the diameter of the ET tube is very important for the resistance. So if there are secretions in the ET tube, that will cause the diameter to become narrow or smaller, so that will increase the resistance, which will increase our PIP, or uh, positive in, uh, inspiratory, pressure, inspiratory pressure. So how to identify, again, by pressure waveform, flow waveform, volume waveform. We will check that in the next slides. But how to fix it? Always to fix the problem, you have to, to, know, the, to know the problem, you can fix it. So if the problem from the, from the secretion, we have to do a proper sectioning. So we take the secretion out, so the ET tube again now is a good seal, a good diameter, so the resistance will come down. If it's from the air, uh, from the, air, uh, from the bronchospasm, we give back-to-back -back nebulization, so the bronchospasm will be relieved, so the, the resistance will come down again. All, um, uh, also, uh, there is the IE ratio, the inspiratory and expiratory time. So if some patient has um, uh, air, uh, air resistance is high, 
we can prolong expiration because they have resistance in the airway. So they need more exhale time to, to take out the volume in the lungs. So that's something we can control in the ventilator, the IE ratio, inspiratory to expiratory time. So in the pressure, if there is increase in the resistance, as Siddiq said, the PIP always um, give us a picture of the airways, the resistance of the airway. The difference between PIP and PIP, uh, the PIP plateau should be 5 to 7. If it's very high, that means there is a resistance in the airway. So that's, that gives us from the pressure, pressure waveform, always we look the difference. If it's high for us, we know that there is a resistance in the airway. Uh, but always in the resistant cases, the PIP plateau will be normal. Always, because there is nothing in the viola inside. Always, uh, it's, uh, it's, all, uh, it's only in the uh, airways. From the, from the, uh, this is actually what we can see here. So post bronchodilator, pre bronchodilator. Here we can see that the flow is restricted and there is more time for exhalation. Like patients prolonged exhalation. That means there is a resistance. He needs more to, because the resistance, the, tube, the, the airway is like this. So he needs more time to get out the, the volume inside. When we give bronchodilators, uh, salbutamol for example, uh, the, 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 the flow comes all the way down. There is no restriction. See? It's no restriction. And the, the exhalation is shorter because there is no obstruction, there is no resistance. So he can get the volume out easily. So from the ventilator, we can know that. Another thing always comes with the resistance compliance. Always. Resistance in the airway, compliance in the alveoli or in the lungs. So compliance, what are the main causes of the reduced compliance? Because for us, high compliance is good. Low compliance is the, the, the bad thing, the poor compliance thing. So ARDS, one of the main things. ARDS, they have very, very, very poor compliance. Poor compliance means what? Means that the lung is very stiff. So to, 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 to inflate the lungs, you need a high pressure or high pressure to inflate that lung. So that means poor compliance. Atelactasis, CHF, fibrosis, ILD, all these kind of will cause poor compliance or low compliance. So how, I, how to identify, again, in the waveforms, from the flow, pressure, and volume. We will come to that next slides. So, this is, this is which uh, waveform? Anyone can tell me, this is what, what, what waveform for what? Pressure waveform. So this is this is pressure waveform. We can easily know that by this. Always there is like a pep and plateau. The, the this one, like this. Okay. So here there is a poor compliance. Why? Because you can see the pep plateau is very high, and the difference is normal. Like the difference is not that high. There is no big difference because if there is a big difference between the plateau and the pep, that's a resistance. But here there is no difference, but the plateau is high. So that's poor compliance. This is a normal one. This is good lung compliance, normal one. See, P plateau is normal here. Here, P plateau is very high. So that requires high pressure. This is the pressure. Requires high pressure to get the volume. Leaps. One of the main things that we should troubleshoot. Uh, leaps. Sometimes ventilator will alarm, people will not give attention, and it causes a big problems for the patient. Because if there is a leaks, that means what? Patient will not get a volume. For example, a pediatric, he needs a volume to wash out, for example, the CO2. In case if there is leaks, we just see the alarms, we don't care about that. Patient will not get the tidal volumes, and that means buildup of CO2, and that could cause CO2 narcosis, could, could cause arrest because of the H ions. So, um, uh, uh, what could be the leaks uh, causes? It could be the ET tube cuff leak, the, 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 the cuff is not inflated well, not properly. Chest tubes can cause leak because of the negative pressure of the chest tube. NG tube in the trachea would also could cause, uh, because sometimes the tube goes in the trachea, if you don't confirm that with the ch chest x-ray, it could cause a leak. Uh, sometimes loose communication, ventilator uh, malfunction also can cause leaks. So how to fix the leaks? Uh, we can, there is something we call it uh, leak, leak test in the ventilators. If we, can, if we can do that one, that will uh, make us safe from the ventilator side. So we will say, okay, the ventilator has nothing to do, we will check the circuit, we will check the ET tube cuff uh, leak, so we, uh, we can do this to fix the problem. So how to I, uh, identify it? So in the volume waveform, it, it's almost the same as uh, air trapping. It will, it will not come back to the baseline. 
So the, if it doesn't come back to the baseline, it could be leak or air traffic. But how we can we, how we can make uh, comp like how we can say okay, this is air traffic or this is leak by the pressure. In the air traffic, the pressures will be high, especially the PIP because of the resistance. But in leak, it, the pressure will be low because there is a leak, so no, no required for the pressures. Okay, and the flow also, the flow waveform. Oh, okay, it's not here. So also, in the, if there is a leak, the flow waveform, the flow will not come back to the baseline because there is a leak. So patient when he exhale, it doesn't come to the, uh, it doesn't come back to the baseline. It's same as air trapping because we said in the air trapping it doesn't come back also to the baseline. But the main thing to, to differentiate between these two again is the pressure in the air trapping pressure high in the leak pressure low. Asynchrony. Uh, also, it's for me, it's one of the most important thing, and I do believe sometimes the doctors themselves, they even, they miss, uh, miss, I mean, um, estimate this thing, like they think asynchrony, that's fine. For me, it's a big deal, because if the patient is asynchronizing with the ventilator, ventilator he will not get the volume, because he should get, for example, 14 breath, 14 breath per minute. In this 14, he is trying to get another breath above the breath. So he will not get this breath and he will not get this, this breath. So now this breath became 13. So his med volume will come down, so he will make, may end up with the uh, uh, increase uh, the CO2. So some of the causes of the asynchrony is air hunger. Anyone knows what is the air hunger? What, what do I mean by air hunger? So if the flow of the ventilator, sometimes we can set the flow, or sometimes by, by the IE ratio flow, if it's low, the patient will feel that, okay, I need more flow, give me more flow. So he'll be like, above, the, above his breathing, and he, is like, he will do like that. So he's hungry for the air. By air, it's flow. So he's hungry for that flow. So he needs, uh, he, this is air hunger. Always we can fix that by increasing the flow. Neurological injury. Sometimes patient, whatever you do, he will be asynchronized because of the neurological. So that the central chemoreceptor or the peripheral chemoreceptor will initiate the breath, not like not organized because of the neurological injury. Even if the patient um, is paralyzed, still he will be having this problem. Paralyzed? No, Carlos. That's that's the solution. If he's paralyzed, then he will not have this problem. Thank you. Improper uh, uh, um, um, sensitivity, as the weak sensitivity is very important. So imagine if you put a sensitivity very difficult for the patient, because in a mode like, as he explained, assess control mode, patient can trigger and the machine can give breath. But imagine uh, you put a very difficult sensitivity. He wants a breath, but, but, but because it's difficult, machine cannot uh, detect, so it's not giving. So in here, the patient will start become like, he wants the breath, but machine is not giving. So there is a synchrony again. So setting a proper sensitivity is very important, and it will help to make uh, to give the best comfortability for that patient. How to identify that by the uh, waveforms? Uh, pressure waveform. Uh, it's it's very very actually it will be very obvious in the ventilator. It will not be like it will be like this. Like uh, there is a breath above breath usually, and you can see it on the patient if he is uh, air hunger. You can see it. He will be like like that. So the, 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 the solution for that, for, for example, um, uh, you can just ask the doctor to increase the sedation in cases like uh, central or uh, neurological. You can fix the, uh, you can fix the sensitivity. Uh, you can play on the eye ratio. Sometimes changing the mode itself. For example, he's in SIMV, he is asynchronizing. If you put him in assist control, he will get more, more, uh, more, uh, more uh, support from the ventilator. He will relax and he will be synchronized well with the ventilator. So this is asynchrony. So it should be like pep, teplato, come down. But look here, here, we call it a scoop here. This one, a scoop or a dip sign. This one, patient is in, inspiring, is, uh, inhaling above the inhalation. This should be inhalation, but he, he wants more. So he, this is a, a flow starvation or air hunger. So if you give him a more flow, if you increase the flow here, he will be fine. This concept is very clear. When you scooping, you know, when you ice cream cup, scoop, it is a scooping. So when you have a ventilator, usually you should have a normal rise. But now he's not having that rise. He's sucking the volume from the ventilator. That volume is sucking. So this tells us that we need something. We need air. 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 We need air
वो पेशेंट जो है वो वेब फॉर्म को सीधा नहीं चलने देता तो वो एकदम उसको सक कर देता है जिसकी वजह से ये स्कूपिंग की एक पोजीशन आ जाती है उसका मतलब है कि पेशेंट को एयर को और तो जिस तरह के कहा जाए कि भाई या तो वॉल्यूम चेंज किया जाए या उसको ज़्यादा वॉल्यूम दिया जाए शायद उसका वॉल्यूम कम हो या अगर कुछ वेंटिलेटर्स इस तरह जिसमें आप फ्लो सेट कर सकते हैं तो फ्लो आप इंक्रीज कर सकते हैं जिसकी वजह से उसको एयर हंगर फिर फील नहीं होगी मोर कम्फर्टेबल रहेगा So again, before I go to complication, if you know troubleshooting, you can help the patient. You can give him more comfortability. You can uh, facilitate faster in the weaning of the patient because he's synchronizing maybe, or you can fix the air trapping, whatever the problem. But if you don't troubleshoot, you don't know what's the problem, right? So no one's aware about the problem. So problem may complicate, may cause pneumothorax, for example, air trapping, one of the most causes of any pneumothorax. Tell me. All right. All right. All right. So last thing I will talk about briefly, these are some complications of the mechanical ventilation, barrel trauma, body trauma, volume induced lung injury, valve, ventilator acquired pneumonia, and um, decreased venous return or decreased BP, the same thing. So these are some complications. I will just briefly talk about the valve, which is the most important thing, and it's all around the world. So VAP means what? VAP means ventilator acquired pneumonia. How we can um, uh, diagnose VAP? These are some criteria to, to say that, okay, this patient has VAP or he developed VAP. New onset of the fever. So if patient has no fever before intubation, once we intubated after maybe four, 12 hours, 24 hours, there is onset of fever, we will think of mm, maybe there is a VAP. Uh, change in the chest X-ray. So before intubation, chest X-ray is quite good. After uh, intubation, infiltrates bilateral or more infiltrates, or, okay, we will think about VAP. Uh, high FI2 demand or increasing in FI2 demand. So, for example, we intubated, we started with the FI2 of 30%. After uh, uh, 18 hours, we, patient is saturating, so we increase the FI2. After again 10 hours, we increase a little more. So, the increasing in the FI2 demands or the requirement of the patient of the oxygen is getting high, we will think of that. Also, the PEEP, the same thing with the PEEP. PEEP demand will be high. If we start with 5, we slowly increasing, we will think of that. Secretion color change. Before intubation, his secretion was slight whitish like that. After intubation, it's thick and uh, become greenish, yellowish. We will think about that. Uh, and the confirmation will be uh, by the labs. In the labs, there will be like that, pseudomonas or whatever the lab is. So uh, how to avoid that? This is very, 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 very important. And especially with pediatrics, I, appreciate, I, I, I request from everyone to, to, to really think about these things with every patient, especially the pediatrics. Proper hand washing. It's it's very easy, very simple. If you do it properly, you can 50% of the lab will go. I guarantee that, trust me. Proper hand washing. Proper hand washing means 30 to 45 seconds properly. Fingers, the nails, the, the, the palm, the backside, proper hand washing, especially with pediatrics, because this, this uh, their immune system is, 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 is not that strong, especially post-operative. Um, sterile, uh, sterile, uh, sterile handling, especially like sectioning, you should be sterile, you should be doing sectioning in proper way. Uh, keep head uh, above elevated. Always, as of our practice in Hamad Hospital, we keep the, for the VAP uh, prevention 30 to 45 degrees. So that's uh, always keep the head for the VAP prevention. <coughs> Encourage frequent mobilization, always frequent mobilization. As soon as possible, change the position. Like, uh, right, you don't just keep the patient on one side. Change the side for the patient every two, three hours. Change the, uh, the, posi uh, the position if possible. Uh, avoid, avoid frequent disconnecting from the uh, tube. Like, don't, don't always disconnect, do a uh, section like out. It, it's good if you have inline closed section. That will help. It's here also, right? Um, it's not here, okay. So inline closed section is one of the best thing also because we will uh, reduce the opening of the ET tube. You don't need to open the ET tube and do it with a suction catheter, no. Because opening the ET tube, it will uh, uh, expose the patient to the air, and air contains germs, so it could cause a vap. Uh, pro proper bronchial proper hygiene, proper oral care, always do good oral care because oral has always has the, the, the bacteria and the viruses. Uh, sedation, vacation, always give chance for the patient to breathe for a while to train his muscles that will also help him to uh, help him to uh, prevent the valve and wean the patient from ventilator as soon as possible don't just be so okay so now let's talk about the non-invasive ventilation and 
Um, my objective is the indication, contraindication, mode of the NIV function, complication, and management. So what is non-invasive ventilation? It's a ventilation without a functional airway. Basically, that's it. So without any invasive uh, ET tube, we have to, uh, we can ventilate without ET tube inside invasive. That's non-invasive ventilation. What, what are my goal or benefits of using NIV? The most important one, improve gas exchange. So if patient, question? Okay. So if patient has a problem with the gas exchange ventilation, like CO2 is high or oxygenation, PaO2 is low, we can improve that with non-invasive without directly go to the invasive ET tube. Uh, avoid intubation, that's the main thing, other, other thing. Decrease mortality, uh, maximize, maximize patient comfort. We can make the patient more comfortable. What are then uh, some indications for the NIV? For me, um, uh, hypercapnic respiratory failure, hypoxemic respiratory failure, uh, weaning post extubation, so we can extubate directly. We can make uh, faster extubation to NIV rather so than you wait. Know, so you guys know the difference between hypercapnic and hypoxemic respiratory failure? What are the two types, right? One because of CO2, one because of O2. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, restricted thoracic diseases, cystic fibrosis, uh, OSA and CSA. This is for the long term. OSA and CSA, NIV are very uh, important for them. Selecting appropriate patient. So how can I use my patient that, okay, this patient is fit for the NIV. If the patient is using the accessory muscle, if he's using accessory muscle and he is tachypnic, um, his CO2 is high than the normal range and he's hypoxemic. So his PaO2 or FI2, the ratio, the ratio of the, between PaO2 and FI2 is below 200. In this case, we will consider the non-invasive ventilation. These are some exclusion. We cannot put NIV for this kind of uh, cases. Low GCS. We never can put uh, NIV for low GCS patients, for example, uh, apnea or ability to protect the airway. Okay? We cannot start NIV for them because if he is apneic, for NIV, he needs to be spontaneous. If he's apneic, we cannot put. Uh, for inability to protect the airway, if he cannot protect the airway, you put NIV, he might aspirate. So we cannot put the NIV, we just directly go to intubation. Hemodynamically or cardiac uh, uh, instability. If BP, for example, is low, we cannot start NIV. I will tell you later why. Uh, patient in, in, uh, incorporated. The patient will refuse sometimes. will be like, no, no, I don't want that. He will restrict, he will refuse. We cannot start it also. Facial trauma or facial burn, we cannot because for NIV we need a facial tight mask. <clears throat> so these are the, the interfaces for the NIV, the masks. So we have the, the, the nasal mask, nasal pillow, and we have the we have the or, or nasal mask and we have the full face mask. It's like this. Oral facial mask is like this. Nasal mask is here, and nasal pillow is like a nasal uh, high nasal cannula. It's like only in the, the trays. And th these are sometimes of the uh, NIVs. This one usually at the home care. The black one, this is the home care. This is the one we are using in the emergencies. This is this has a little bit advanced modes and it's more uh, stronger. Some ventilators also can uh, provide invasive and non-invasive. So this, for example, the servo oil, it can be used with the intubated patient and it also uh, can be used with non-invasive, without intubation, just with the mask. Now, let's come to the most important things here, the modes of NIV. Everyone should know about this, CPAP and BiPAP. What is CPAP? We always use NIV, CPAP, CPAP. CPAP is continuous positive airway pressure. So, uh, simply, it's a continuous pressure in inhalation and exhalation. So, for example, if, if I have a flow, for, uh, flow waveform from myself, it will be like the first one, at zero. There is no pressure now, and there is no pressure. I'm breathing. Uh, exhaling, inhaling. Inhaling is negative because I have negative pressure. Inhaling, exhaling, inhaling. When I apply a CPAP, now the baseline is not zero. I applied some pressure, so it's five. So that will, that's that's the CPAP. That will improve my FRC. That will uh, recruit my lungs. That will help in the oxygenation. BiPAP or bilevel. What is bilevel? It's like CPAP, but above that there is inspiratory pressure. So there is IPAP and EPAP. EPAP is like CPAP. So IPAP is inspiratory positive airway pressure. Uh, EPAP is expiratory positive airway pressure. The difference, the difference between the IPAP and the EPAP, we call it delta pressure or pressure support. This difference will give us the tidal volume, which will wash out the CO2. So if we want, if the patient is hypercapnic, CO2 is high, we should increase the delta pressure by increasing the IPAP, keep the EPAP the same, or uh, reducing Maybe you the can show them on the, on the yeah, floor. Yeah, yeah, I will show them. So this is the CPAP, as we discussed, CPAP of five, only one pressure. This is the BiPAP, uh, two pressures, the EPAP and the IPAP. 
for example, 10 and 5. The difference between them, this is the data pressure, the pressure support. That the, this data will uh, determine the wash of the CO2 or the determine the tidal volume that the patient should get, which should be between 5 to 8 mils per kg. So what is NIV function? Why I, what, what, I, what I'm expecting from the NIV? Overcome the intrinsic teeth, uh, reducing the patient respiratory rate and reduce, reducing the patient uh, work of breathing, increasing his tidal volume so he can wash out more CO2, uh, basically improve the labs, PaO2, pH, and PaCO2. What's happening in that cardiogenic pulmonary edema? There, there is usually a left side weakness or left side failure in the left side of the heart. So that will cause what? The buildup of the fluid to the right, uh, uh, left atrium, then to the lungs. So there will be more fluid because due to the increase in the hydrostatic pressure in the AC membranes. So fluid will be in the alveoli. So if the fluid in the alveoli, that will reduce the surface area of the alveoli and that will cause the patient to struggle to get the gas exchange. So he will become like, he will feel like, okay, I cannot get the oxygen. And he will become tachypneic, increase work of breathing because of that fluid inside the alveoli, like we can see it there, down the picture. So that also eventually will, be, will end up with increasing in the CO2. By, by applying NIV, what will happen? Uh, the, the upper picture. NIV, we will put the positive airway pressure, especially the CPAP, so the positive pressure will push the fluid away from the alveoli toward the AC membrane, so now the surface area of the alveoli itself is bigger, higher, more. So, uh, more, 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 for good, good, better for the gas exchange, better for the oxygenation, so patients slowly will feel, usually in one to two hours, will feel more comfortable with the NIV. Imagine if you don't have an idea, what will happen for this kind of patient? Intubation. Because they, are, they will be severely tachypneic, CO2, high flow nasal cannula will never work for them. So, intubation. But alhamdulillah, we have NIV. NIV, we can, two hours, you will totally, with getting for sure, for sure, with getting of lasers and this diuretics, uh, NIV, he will be fine without need of invasive uh, intubation. Um, so, this is. Uh, uh, left side of the, uh, this is the right side of the heart, superior vena cava, inferior vena cava. When we apply a positive intra a positive airway, uh, the CPAP or BiPAP, we will apply intrathoracic pressure, and that also will affect the the, the vena cava itself. So it will uh, constrict them for a while, for uh, uh, somehow. That will cause what? That will cause the venous return to reduce. As the venous return to reduce, and patient already have the left side weakness, the failure on the left side, if there is less blood, this will struggle less because you will have to pump less. So that will help also, that's another way to help the pulmonary edema because he has no too much, uh, he has not to work too much to, 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 to take that fluid out because there is already less fluid, less blood. So less blood to took out so that there is no buildup and there is no pul pulmonary edema. So that's one of the ways. So it will improve the lung compliance, it will improve the FRC functional residual capacity, uh, reduce the work of breathing, reduce the need of intubation, which is our goal. We don't want, we don't want to intubate the patient. So, uh, initial IPAP or EPAP settings. Basically, you start with minimal settings. The IPAP 10 and EPAP of 5. And by 10 and 5, we will, we will look for the exhale tidal volume. If it's acceptable, we will keep 10 over 5. If exhale tidal volume is very low, like for example, it's not between 5 to 8 ml per kg, we will increase the gap, the gap. So we'll increase the IPAP and keep the EPAP the same, if oxygenation is good. If oxygenation is not good, we will increase both EPAP and IPAP, because EPAP is for oxygenation, IPAP is for the ventilation, the delta. So again, if oxygenation is good and we, we want to increase the tidal volume, we only increase the IPAP. So we start 12 over 6, we increase like 14 over 6 to get more tidal volume. If you see tidal volume good fast, we get the same. If oxygenation is the problem, we increase the EPAP and the same time we increase the IPAP. I will show like this. So like here. Here, we increase only the EPAP, the green one. We increase only, this is my delta now, right? I increase only the EPAP, so my delta is low now. And I told you, delta is the one important for the tidal volume. If my delta is low, I okay, I improved oxygenation, but I reduced my delta, I reduced my volume, so CO2 will start slowly to increase. So I have always, if I increase EPAP, I have to increase the IPAP to keep, to keep the same mean ventilation. All right? Um, like in the second one, 
we increase the EPAP, but at the same time we increase the IPAP, so we have the same delta. For sure, everything has a complication, and these are some complications of the NIV, facial and nasal pressure injury. And that's actually, we, we, we face it out in the Ahmed Hospital, and uh, yeah. So, this is the nasal pressure ulcer, this is very bad one. So this is uh, some gastric distension, because it's a positive pressure, so for sure it's, uh, it will cause some gastric distension. Dry mucous membrane, because it's dry, so always we should put humidification. And aspiration is another complication of NIV, because it's, again, it's a positive pressure, so it could cause gastric distension, vomiting, and aspiration. Monitoring. Monitoring is very important. We always mo should monitor our patient, so we will make sure that patient is in the safe side. So we should monitor the clinical presentation of the patient. Okay, when we apply the NIV, is his patient comfortable? Is his rate is coming down? Is his saturation is going up? Is his uh, uh, work of breathing is coming down? We should uh, also check the, the labs, the blood gas. We should also check the chest X-ray, for example, if we start with NIV for the lung collapse. After one hour or two hours, we check chest X-ray. Okay, we should monitor chest X-ray. There is improvement. There is uh, 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 the, the collapse gone now. So we should monitor the patient. The vital signs, respiratory rate, heart rate, and BP. Why I say BP? Because as I explained in the pulmonary edema, when you start NIV, you put intrathoracic pressure. So you will put pressure on the right side of the heart, so venous return will come low. So if patient is all, all, already in the high potential side, he will become more hypotensive. So always our eyes should be up toward the BP. BP is good? Okay. NIV, BP, together always. Because NIV, especially with high pressure, will reduce the venous return and the BP. So now, this is some. Uh, this is like a question I want to ask. We will ask uh, our audience since they were very focusing on the presentation. Okay. Okay. If the IPAP is dropped, what do you think? What will happen? You know, the EPAP is there. IPAP is there. IPAP is dropped. What is going to happen to your tidal uh, volume? It will decrease. Good. What will happen to your ventilation? It will also drop. And what will happen to your CO2? It will increase. Exactly. Next one. So if the IPAP is high. Someone? Tidal volume will improve, right? And your ventilation will improve and CO2 come down. Next one. EPAP. So EPAP, if you increase the EPAP, what happens to your FRC? It improves, right? And then uh, your oxygenation, obviously you get more EPAP, more ventilation, more oxygenation. And then your tidal volume will? EPAP will improve indirectly, but not directly. Because you're giving the recruitment, so with recruitment it will improve as well. So next one, EPAP. If it's dropped, FRC will go down. Your tidal volume will be? Go down. Yeah, go down. <laughs> because you have uh, collapse. That's why the tidal volume will be up. Okay. PO2 will drop. So, yeah, Haas, we are almost uh, here to the end. So termination of NID. Everything we need to start, you should stop it or should end it. So how will it? it, it uh, well, no, this is termination. This is when to stop it. If there is deterioration in the patient situation, the patient is getting worse and worse after the NIV, we should stop it. Consciousness is coming down, um, uh, developing symptoms of complications. So like for example, as I said, the BP. After applying the uh, NIV, BP dropped very down, or very low, became very low. We just have to uh, stop it, terminate it, or uh, support the BP. Sometimes the family, some family see that the patient will like suffering or something, family will be like, no, let's remove it. So we have to uh, terminate. Weaning. So as we see here, the, the very simple technique for weaning is reduce the pressure, increase time off. What I mean by time off of the, of the machine. So usually, like for example, we put two hours on the NIV and two hours off the NIV. Uh, slowly we will increase the pressures. For example, my pressures are 14 over 6, I will make it 12 over 6, 10 over 6. And then I also the, the off time, like for example, it was two hours on, two hours off. Then I make it three hours off, two hours on. Then I make it four hours on, off, two hours on. That how. If patient still oxygenating well and he is stable, we can continue until we reach the low pressures, for example, 10 over 6. Then from IPA, from BiPAP, we change to CPAP, shift to CPAP. If he's still stable, saturating well, low tachypneic and water breathing is good, we can just directly stop the NIV, go to simple mask or, or nasal cannula or whatever. 
So post weaning always the assess the patient. Not just uh, we wean him off and then he's uh, good, leave him. No. We should assess, we should check, okay. After one hour, two hours, we check the blood gases, still good, oh, he's doing fine. So then tell us. We can say we can be said that okay, Alhamdulillah, he's good now. Thank you. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, uh, my, I had one or two quick questions. Uh, now, when we say that uh, non-invasive ventilation, there's no endotracheal tube. I, I know that uh, there are a couple of centers that we visited, especially in India, uh, at uh, Fortis. Um, they're intensivist. As a, it, was, it was kind of surprising. Almost most of their patients had a nasopharyngeal ET tube in place, and they were hooked up to a regular ventilator which was giving them that, because Mojito is the, the bigger problem that we have, we do not have the BiPAP machines or the CPAP or the Hamilton one that we're talking about. <coughs> Our neonatology unit has jerry-rigged, I think it was cost 5 lakh rupees, but it's made locally. I was thinking that if you look at that, one visit, if you can look at that, and if that thing is sort of something we can use, we can aid, we'll try to invest, getting that, or the simplest thing would be if you you use that nasopharyngeal uh, tube placement and that's hooked up to a, because our, that might be something we could do very quickly. Our experience with CPAP and BiPAP has been, with CPAP especially, has been very variable. Some patients are fighting it, next thing you know, within two hours, a chabalat dharmyana bacha was looking worse. I mean, and. Uh, I don't know, maybe we're doing it wrong. So we need to really um, educate what we're doing, what we're doing, what we're doing, what we're doing. So uh, considering your uh, first point, uh, Dr. Samad, uh, you're saying the NPT. NPT, we use it, but nowadays we have stopped using it. We use it only for very quiet indication. But it can help you in terms, in terms of the fact that you don't have all the resources, so maybe you can replace that with that. So the main thing that we use it sometimes with the upper airway uh, floppiness. Patients who has upper airway floppiness or upper airway issues, we usually, instead of going to BiPAP mask, we use the NPT, so to, you will bypass the upper airway. So that's one. And the uh, the second thing, just remind me, your question was about the... A CPAP, okay. Uh, the problem could be because most of the time, no one likes CPAP. So what we do, we start with CPAP and the child is irritable. Uh, we have experienced pneumothorax to the point that the whole lung is gone. So uh, what? then we came up with something called like chloral hydrate. They say the chloral hydrate is much more tolerable by, I mean sedation, which can be anything that you guys are comfortable with. So using sedation with, uh, with the CPAP or non-invasive is much more helpful. So you give the patient time to adapt to the system and later on he will be smiling on this thing. And what about press specs? Chloral hydrate is not difficult. Warning, Alan. No, 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 no,